So I think we can start. Hello, everybody. Get in, take your seats. Um, we are going to talk about automated testing today, uh, especially about the PHP unit framework, which we are using in Drupal core to run tests. Um, my name is Klaus Burer. I work as a software engineer in Vienna for Epico, a small company doing job boards based on Drupal. Um, I'm on the Drupal security team, do a couple of other stuff on Drupal.org, maintain a couple of modules like the Coda modules, the, the Ruth module. And recently I've been helping out with the PHP un unit initiative. It's a core initiative that we just launched uh, yesterday. Yeah, I'm Daniel Wehner. I'm working for Chapter 3 in San Francisco. I'm maintaining a couple of subsystems in core, of which use and menu system is one of them. I'm involved in the PHP unit initiative as well, and I'm also part of the API first initiative. Okay, so we get started quickly because we have a lot of ground to cover. First, we are going to talk a bit about uh, uh, the theoretical background of automated testing. What is it actually? So if you consider you have a website and you want to make sure it actually works, then what you can do is build a checklist of things that should be there and should be working. Um, for example, that there is a login link on your page. So you write it down, check that there is a login link on, your, uh, on the front page. Um, then you do uh, changes to your sites. Uh, it's also known as development. Deploy them to your site and of course you want um, to check your site, site again to make sure that it has not uh, been malformed, that it still works, that the login link is still there. And you can do this with manual testing like a human, then go through the checklist and then make sure that everything is still working again. This is how we do it um, when there are no auto automated tests. Of course, this is a lot of work because a human has to go through many things. This is tedious because humans easily get bored and they make mistakes when they go through the checklist, so it's not ideal. What we can do instead is automated testing. So you have this checklist, want to, what you want to make sure that your site delivers, what the features of your site are, and you write them down as executable code. And that is automated testing then. For example, instead of a human checking that there is a login link on a front page, your code does it for you, your test code that you have written. Then you do the changes, also known as development, your site changes, then you can execute the tests again. Ah, and when they are green, you know at least the login link on the front page still works. I'm saying at least here because um, with automated testing, you never get 100% coverage, right? You can try to get as, as much coverage for your application as you can, for as much, much features as you can, but there's only uh, so much that you can do to make sure that something works. So um, you can even go further and run your test code in regular intervals, and, which means you automate your test runs. You can, for example, run them once per day and then see um, everything is still working. Or you can run them whenever somebody pushes to the branch, run them, uh, that, that change, that git commit didn't break anything, we are still good, everything is still green. And you can even do continuous integration, which means um, somebody pushes stuff to the master branch, it gets tested automatically, when everything is green, it gets deployed automatically. Um, you can do this really to a, to a high extent. Here's an example of what um, the output of PHP unit looks like. You see the dots that are the, the, the test cases that run and then in the end you get a final report that everything is okay or not. So this is kind of a bit of inception. So you write a program and then you write another program and you use a program to test the program. So it's really a lot of programming going on. And what I want to say with this slide is you shouldn't underestimate this. Writing automated tests is a bit of work and it's a bit of effort. I mean, it pays off for your most important features, but you should keep in mind that this doesn't come for free. You need to be able to, to sell this to your client, include it in your price so that you have actually time to work on automated tests. It's not for free. There are different testing levels that we have to consider when we write um, automated tests. Um, the most important three I have listed here, those are unit tests, integration tests, and system level or functional level tests. And uh, unit tests, they try to test the smallest possible unit in isolations, for example, PHP functions or PHP methods or even whole classes. Um, the advantages of that is that they verify that individual parts actually work, which also means I can quickly track down the problem if the tests fail. PHP unit will tell me um, this function didn't uh, deliver the output as we have expected in the test case, so I know uh -huh, this function is at fault and can fix the problem there. I don't have to do any system setup because I'm only um, testing one part of the system which has, has been isolated. So I don't need to set up a database. I don't need to set up a browser or anything else. I can just run the unit test. That's also why they are very fast. Um, 
there are also, of course, a couple of disadvantages. So whenever you change your code very heavily, which is called a refactoring, so maybe that function doesn't even exist anymore, of course, your test testing that function will also fail because the function is not there. So you also have to adapt your test cases. Um, it can be complicated to provide fake objects, which is called mocking, um, to your uh, class that you want to test. So your class, of course, calls out to other subsystem. It wants to send an email or it wants to do some logging. So it needs those dependencies um, mocked into the class so that it can actually call it. So you, in some cases, if a class, has, a class has many dependencies, you will get into complicated mocking, which can be a bit annoying. And of course, in the end, that's the biggest downside of unit tests. You have no actual guarantee that your whole system actually works. You've verified that single components work, but hmm, who knows if the whole system works. That's why you should also have integration level tests. They do tests on components. So not a single class, but how components interact with each other. For example, if you think of Drupal 8, you have a plugin. You test with an integration test that the plugin is actually found by the plugin manager, that it can be instantiated, and that the plugin actually does something. This is more than a unit test. This is tests integration with the Drupal plugin system itself. So the advantages of that, that um, you verify a bigger part of your application, which means not only some uh, small parts of the unit test, but even more um, is verified to be working. And it's also somewhat easy to locate bugs. I still know, ah, it's in this component. It's in a mail component, for example, if I test that component. So that's also pretty good. Of course, there are some, some disadvantages. It's a bit slower than um, in unit tests. Depending on what you need your integration test to do, you probably need a database or some discovery of plugins or whatever. So there is some setups uh, required, which also makes the test execution slower. And we still have the downside that it doesn't actually guarantee that the end user facing feature of your Drupal project of a website actually work. So what can we do about that? Hmm, there's the level of functional level testing. And this tests um, the whole, the complete system. The pros for that, we can verify that what the user sees, we replicate it in a test environment and verify that this actually works. So this is, this is really good. And it also works um, that we, when we refactor code, so everything, every implementation details are changed. We can still execute the tests most of the time and they still confirm, yes, when I go to this page and request it, it still returns the same output. This also helped us the, the big migration of Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. We had a lot of those um, functional tests that verify that nodes still work while we uh, exchanged the complete architecture of Drupal 7 and swapped in the Drupal 8 code base that we have right now. We, st we still could verify with this test that Drupal still delivers its features. Of course, there are a lot of cons to, to functional level tests. They are very slow because you have to set up a web server, you need a database, and you need a browser, and you need to install Drupal for each test run. So this is a lot of work, heavy system setup, which means you have a lot of moving parts, which means you can have random test failures, right? Suddenly on your test system, the disk is full. This happens on the test bot all the time. Or um, MySQL goes down, or the browser has a timeout, or whatever. There, there are several moving parts that can go wrong. And it's also hard to locate the origins of bug, right? If, if some page doesn't deliver this, which module is responsible? What is actually broken in my code? I need to then debug this to actually find out where something is broken. Contrary to that, unit tests are much better because they, they tell you where exact the problem is in which function. And yeah, as I said, prone to random test fails, all kind of things can go wrong. And they are also hard to change because they are so complicated to set up. It's not, not an easy task to maintain um, uh, function level tests. That being said, it's important that you have all three. So if you want to have really good coverage for your web application, it's important that you have these three levels so that you can track um, errors down fast, but also have a complete test of the user-facing features. But there's a, a whole testing universe out there, right? So we, the, um, we distinguish between white box and black box testing. You would say to unit tests are mostly white box testing because they know about the code flow, they know about functions, they know which code paths can be taken and they explicitly test for that versus black box testing, which more is like the functional um, testing category where you test just the input and uh, you provide an input and just test uh, the output that is actually there, that the HTML page is there. There are also other testing types for performance, for security, for sanity testing to make sure that Drupal even bootstraps, so to make sure that um, PHP doesn't throw fatal errors, regression testing, usability testing, all kind of stuff that you can get into. And there's also the discipline of test-driven development, which means when you implement a feature, you actually write a test first and then see it fail. Something is read, so because you haven't written the actual implementation yet, then you write the implementation, make the test green again, and level up your implementation one step after the other. 
And then I already mentioned continuous testing and continuous delivery, so automating your test runs, give uh, developers feedback early when they uh, work in their feature branches or when they deploy stuff. There's also property-based testing where you analyze the data types that some function, for example, in your code accepts and try to come up to auto-generate test sets that you pass in. I'm just mentioning those here so that you can look them up if you find them inter interesting. We will mostly talk about these three-level things I explained earlier. All right, now that we have seen like a little bit of history and, and especially like theory about testing, let's have a look how you can actually test stuff in Drupal and how we do it in core and in contrib. So um, historically, we used to use the testing framework called Simple Test. Back in 2008, I guess, it was like a good thing. People used it in the entire PHP community. Um, you know, we, we started to leverage it. We started to write our tests. As Klaus, you mentioned, like the entire code base of Drupal 7 was, was tested with it. We wrote a good bunch of tests. These 405 tests are actually not the right number. We are actually having much, much more tests, but 405 tests are still simple tests. Um, and all those tests are those fun functional system level tests. Um, those allows, as, as Klausi mentioned, those allowed us to rewrite Drupal in a sense for Drupal 8. So it was really a great tool back then. But you know, life changes, the world changes. Um, so what happened is that the entire PHP community moved to a different testing framework called PHP unit. Um, it's way more mature and advanced uh, uh, compared to simple test because like it has way more future, uh, features and especially it has way more integrations with other systems. For example, if you use Jenkins for your continuous delivery, it is just there. You have a plugin for PHP unit and you don't have to think about it. The same with your integrated development environment. You ch like PHP Storm just have a PHP, uh, a PHP unit plugin and you can, can just use it there. So Drupal started in 2013 to think, yeah, that's the future, so let's go with it. So it's still 2016 and we haven't finished the process yet, but we are in the process of doing so and that will be part of the, uh, of the talk later. As of now, we have 700, 570 tests. Or I guess the numbers is, uh, are wrong anyway, but <laughs> it is kind of like a comparison already. And those levels, those tests, what we have in PHP unit now are unit tests and integration tests. And most of the functional, functional tests are still in simple tests. But yeah, let's have a look how we actually do something. So let's talk about unit tests first. It's the foundation of testing. I'm a huge fan of thinking of testing as a pyramid. So you have a base layer of unit tests which cover a lot of your logic. Then you have like a smaller layer on top of that for the integration tests and you have a final um, step for the functional tests uh, at the top. Which So you have way more unit tests ideally than uh, functional tests. Anyway, unit tests are tests in isolation you test just the component for itself and just how the component works without thinking about the world otherwise. This is really good for testing logic. So in case you have like a complex logic, if A and B or C or D, um, then you can test all the cases which are possible and ensure that things are actually rock solid. Um, as Klausi started to mention, dependencies on, in your code are problematic. So if you, for example, send out an email, you need, you need something which sends out the email. If you talk to the database, you need somehow the database in your code. Um, that makes it harder to test because you need to fake those real things. In order to avoid that, there is like an entire thing called functional testing, um, which is like a totally different programming way, but we can leverage that partly in PHP by writing pure functions. Pure functions are functions which just have input and output and no side effects between that, uh, outside of that. So in there happens something, so you give, in, give it some input and it returns some output and that makes it really easy to test. Um, here's some nice comparison between unit tests and integration tests. Here's a unit test which perfectly works. You know the log works, as you see? Yeah, it totally works exactly like the specification says so. 
But as you see, yeah, in real life, things are different. <laughs> so unit tests don't cut it completely, but we need some kind of integration test. But it's important to get that part of the log done properly. <laughs> All right. So let's have a look at an actual example. Um, so if you want to write a unit test, you need to write a new PHP class. In, in our case, it's called HTML escape text test. And this class has to extend a, a certain base class called unit test case. Um, in there, you need to define the, the things you actually want to test. These are a couple of test methods. So a test method is a function which starts with the string test and then some name. So in this case, it's test count. This indicates that we are testing the count method. This at covers here at the top also indicates that we are testing the count method. And what we're doing in this test function is we're getting a string, we're doing something here, we create a new HTML escape text object. It doesn't matter what it's doing here, it's just general idea. We are doing something, you see here this count method, so we have this object, we call the count method. We expect it's doing something, it has some result, and we ensure that the result, which is the right side of the equation, in quotes, um, is exactly what we expect it to be. So assert equals expects like an expected value and an actual value. And uh, if you specify it like that, PHP unit, in case you have a bug, um, will tell you this is the expected value, but this was the actual value, you have a bug in your code. There's a little bit more. You, you have, or you can define in those tests. Um, here at the top, you see the at covers default class annotation. Uh, that allows you to specify which is the code you are actually testing. By doing so, um, PHP unit can provide you a code coverage. A code coverage basically says, okay, these are all code paths you have tested, and these are the code paths you haven't tested. So if you want to have a rock-solid test um, suit, you basically check which parts of the code aren't tested, and then you can write additional tests for those cases. Um, that makes it really handy, potentially for like reviewers to see how well is your test coverage. Sadly, we don't leverage that in Drupal at all. Uh, we just provide it. Um, yeah. Once you have defined the test function, you need to probably also run the test. So how do you run the test? It's interesting because, so just to be clear, this is green. It's not yellow. <laughs> it is kind of yellowish for me. Um, so how do, you, how do you run the test? You first copy this phpunit.xml.dist file to phpunit.xml. Um, that allows you to provide some custom configuration, um, like, for example, the database connection details, like username, password, host, and database name, and the, the URL to your site. Once you have that set up, Drupal, or no, the testing framework can run those tests. Um, in this case, um, we are running this HTML escape text, taste, text test and in order to do so, you like specify the path vendor bin PHP unit. You give it like dash the core. It, that picks up this configuration file you specified down there, and then the entire path to your test file. And by doing so, it you know it's loading the file, executes it, checks the result, and in case everything is alright, it returns okay. Here, let's go to the next level of testing. Klaus he explained. The next level is integration testing. Our integration testing is called kernel tests. It's called kernel because the main component of Drupal, which boots up Drupal, is the kernel. And in that kernel, it ensures that you have the database. In this kernel test, it ensures that you have basically every API available. So with that, you can test your API. For example, you can test that if you save an entity, and you validate it, that the actual validation is run, and you save it, and then you can ensure that it actually got stored in the database, and so on and so forth. 
um, compared to unit test, this is much, much slower. It's probably like 100 times or so, I, I would guess so. Um, but it allows you to cover much more. Um, you know, database I.O., it's, it's horribly slow. Avoid it, side effects. Um, but still, it's pretty nice. Let's have a look how an actual example looks like. So this is example is testing the locking system in Drupal. So the system which allows you to create a lock and ensure that not multiple processes hate each other. Um, so in order to test that, we need to write another test class, in this case, lock test. Uh, the uh, base class you need to extend is kernel test base, um, which does magic for you. So this sets up the database for you, ensures that everything is loaded properly. Um, yeah. In the test, we you know, we create some object and call some methods on there. In this case, we acquire a lock, check whether this acquiring f uh, worked, then we check whether a lock is still available. No, it's not because it's already acquired, um, and we check that. On here, you see another test uh, assertion method called SA2, which is expecting a Boolean. So if it's true, everything is fine. If it's false, something is wrong. Um, on top of that, here you see like a, a message. You can give those, uh, these assertions. And this method helps you to understand what went wrong when you actually have a failing test. So this message on the right side would be printed out when, like, when an actual bug appears somehow in your code. So yeah, but it is conceptually really similar to a unit test. Um, let's go to the next level. This is the functional test level. Um, we call it browser test because in our domain, the web, um, the system we are dealing with is mostly a browser. Um, so a browser test sets up an entire Drupal. So it creates the database, creates all the tables, even creates you know, some users, installs the configuration on your site. And then you, know, you can just use a browser and go to your site, do some stuff like log in, create a node, save it, check whether the title appears on the top of your page, something like that. Um, in order to do that, um, we are leveraging a thing called Mink. Mink is a browser abstraction layer. So this talks with some browser. By default, we are having like a PHP-based browser, but we can also plug in other kind of browsers. For example, we now plug in uh, PhantomJS, which is a headless browser based upon Chrome. So that allows us to actually test, for example, JavaScript. We will see that later. Browser tests are even way slower. It is just another order of magnitude slower. So if a kernel test takes a second, for example, browser test takes like 10 seconds to set up and run. So have, let's have a look at the browser test example. Uh, this is coming from Wools because they adapted browser tests really early. Um, so in this case, we're actually extending a Wools browser test base, which according to Klaus is much, much better than the default browser test base. Um, but maybe we should get something from that into core. <laughs> anyway, you are extending browser test space in this case. And you see here are actual like written down definitions of kind of what the user should do. So we create a user, we log in, we go to a certain page. This duplicate goes to a specific page. We click some link, we fill in some form, form fields, we press a button and so on and so forth. Um, at the end here, we then actually ensure that like the browser did what, or like the system did what we expected. Um, this is a little bit special down here because it's not longer just SO2 or SO equals, but it's rather SO session which gives us a helper object to deal with assertions for browsers. So in this case, we are ensuring that the HTTP status code is like 200 and we see some certain message on the page. Um, with that kind of pattern, you can then write the functionality, or you can write tests for the actual functionality on your site. Pretty easily, depends. But it is, it is a lot of code. So in case you add test coverage, it adds maintenance cost. So we have to, you have to think about what you're doing. 
The next level is uh, JavaScript testing. Um, we are using a non. Mm, we are using PHP to test JavaScript. Let's frame it like that. Basically, instead of the PHP-based browser as we had before, we are now plugging um, PhantomJS, at least at the moment, um, which allows us to actually do screenshots. Oh, sorry. Shit. There we go. Um, this is an actual screenshot from a running test. It is really minimal because by default we are installing no theme or like some seven or some basic theme. Um, JavaScript tests are though pretty tricky because browsers or JavaScript do things asynchronously. So in this case, this is the toolbar. So we want to ensure like clicking on this link, the toolbar pops up. And if you click it again, the toolbar is hidden again. Um, this requires in Drupal, for example, an actual HTTP request to fetch the data of the toolbar, so it takes time. Um, but as PHP is running synchronous, so uh, like just imperative style, just next to each other, um, we need to ensure that the browser, which is in another process, actually did its thing. So um, you need to basically check continuously until some, some interaction finish. We have a look at that now. Um, so this is another example, which is click sorting. So, you know, you can, on a table, click on the header, and then it sorts the, the, the rows according to this um, column. So in this case, you need to extend the JavaScript test base class, and then it ensures that some phantom JS works for you. Um, stuff is going on. You click on a link. This is the actual, like, uh, table header. And then, and then, like in the background, an HTTP request is fired in the browser, um, and you need to ensure that the HTTP request finished and everything. And therefore, we have developed an actual helper function called assert wait on AJAX request. Um, but on top of that, there are also helper functions to ensure that a certain bit of interaction on the page happened. So you need to write some jQuery to detect that a certain DOM element, for example, exists. Um, that's kind of tricky to figure out, potentially. So, yeah. Um, anyway, at the end, again, we test some stuff and ensure that things are working as expected. So now talking a bit about test ingredients, we saw some examples already. I'm going a bit deeper into that. Um, we already saw the setup methods in these test classes, and we do that um, to create stuff that you need in every test method beforehand, before the test is executed. So uh, what the base classes do for you is set up the database, set up the configuration, set up even test data. And what you can do in addition, for example, in a new test, create some mocks that you will need in all your test cases. Um, and there's also the teardown function, which you probably will not need, but setup is something that you do. So what you do in a setup method, you call the parent, which does some parent work, like installing databases or whatever. So always call the parent uh, method in the beginning. And then you do, for example, create a content type that you will use for testing and then a note for it so that you have two nodes and then do some stuff with them. This is pretty straightforward, not a big deal. Um, then the most crucial part of a test is, of course, to assert something. So what we do with assertions is uh, we compare something expected that should happen with uh, the result that actually happens. Um, so we do some testing, and in the end, there should always be an assertion which um, ensures that the executed stuff has the result that we uh, want to have. So if an, uh, such an assertion is not fulfilled, if the expectation, ex expectation is not fulfilled, then the test is failed automatically. And what PHPUnit does in this case, uh, it throws an exception which means PHPUnit will walk down your test case until it reaches the first assertion that fails and then the exception is thrown and your test case is over and you will get uh, uh, an exception and PHPUnit will be read and will print you out, oh, I expected a Boolean true but I got a false at this line and it points you to the exact line in the test case and then you can start debugging and see what's going on there. This is a bit different to simple test which we know from uh, Drupal already because simple test, if an, uh, an assertion fails, it will still continue to execute the test, right? So this has advantages and disadvantages, but it's just something 
useful to know when you work with PHP unit that as soon as the first assertion failed, it stops this particular test case, then either moves on to the next, next test case if you run multiple ones, or if you just run that single one, then it stops immediately. Um, what PHP unit also does for you, it automatically asserts that there are no PHP warnings, uh, no fatal errors or anything. Whenever that happens, PHP unit stops immediately and says you, oh, there a notice has occurred. You shouldn't have notices in your code base. And also the test has failed. Um, PHP unit also gives you a tool to have data providers versus multiple assertions. So you can have a set of test fixtures um, that you can pass to your tests and then assert um, stuff on them. I will show you some example later. Um, some assertion examples here. So you have a wide variety of assertion methods in PHP unit core. You can, of course, compare stuff if it's actually the same. This works on primitives like integers. This works also on objects if it's actually the same object or on arrays. They help us to assert that something is contained in something else, for example, in arrays, or it works on strings. You can count stuff. Um, the reason why there are these um, assert helpers, you could, you could always do all of this with assert same, right? But it's much more readable if you use these assert helpers, then the line gets shorter and it's immediately clear what the assertion should do. So there's also stuff to assert regular expressions or that the string starts with something, yeah. And then we have the browser tests, which are on a functional level that we mentioned. There we have some special session uh, assert object where you can do stuff with the current page you are on. You can verify that the response that the browser got actually delivered the status code to 100. You can assert that you are in a certain um, URL. You can assert that you uh, have a button on the page with a certain label. Um, yes, there's a lot of stuff that you can do, checkboxes, whatever. Um, there's also a link to the uh, PHP unit documentation, which has also some, some great info about assertion messages. Um, we already mentioned mocking for unit tests. Um, this is where you have to fake dependencies. So you want to test your function, your class in isolation, but it, it tries to call out to the database, so we need to fake the database. And what we do nowadays when we write PHP unit tests is use the mocking framework called Prophecy. And Prophecies gives you a lot of nice helper uh, functions and classes that you can use. So we have uh, four different types of test doubles or test fakes that we are going to use. Uh, the first one is uh, doubled that aren't really used. So you just um, get an object and whenever you call a method on it, it will just return null. It's when, when you test code and the database is not actually used, you can just give it a dummy, the class in a constructor, because in a constructor it might need the database. You give it some dummy and then you test a method which doesn't even use the database, then such a dummy is fine. Then you can also have stubs. Stubs, then there you can put arbitrary primitive functionality on them. You can say when this method is called, then return a certain predefined value. You can go even further and make your fake to a, a mock. Then you say, um, I specify that a certain method should be called. So for example, I'm faking the mail system and now I'm testing something with the mail system and this mail method on this, this fake object should be called. So you can assert that. And when it's not called, then PHP unit will fail your test. It works together with Prophecy to ensure that all the expectations are, are matched. Um, and the last one is spies. It's basically the same as mocks, but you can run your test code with your, your mocks and in the end you can, you can question prophecy, has this method been called and how many times? So there are some um, inspection features with mocking where you can say which method has been called on this uh, faked object exactly. So here are some, here's a short collection of prophecy examples to see this in practice. So at first we set up a dummy, uh, our mail manager object, and we call the prophesize method. This gives you a so-called profit in prophecy, which means um, you can get a fake object that will implement the mail manager interface class that we have here. Um, to get our dummy out, we just call the reveal method. So we don't do any further setup of our profit, we just say, okay, whatever, just some random dummy which returns null every time. I don't care that it does actually anything. Then we just call the reveal function and we are done with the dummy. If we want to do more advanced stuff, we can turn it into a stub by returning something. So I can say, if the mail method on the mail manager is called with the parameters of this email address, admin at example.com, and the second parameter, which might be a subject test, then this fake object should return some array which says result true. This uh, exactly fulfills the stuff that we have defined in mail manager class. And then we can also make it a mock at the same time by saying this mail method should be called exactly one time. 
So the test will fail if it hasn't been called at all, then the test will fail, or if it has, called been, it has been called more than once, then the test will also fail. So the next part is where we actually set up the, the object that we want to test. In this case, it's a rule as action, so we instantiate it. This is the actual class under test, so this is not a fake, this is the real class we actually want to test. We pass in the, the fake object, we call reveal again, then um, the prophet is turned into the actually, actual fake thing that you want to test. Then we do some testing, we set some context values here and execute the action. And in the end, we can spy on stuff, we can say, oh, if there has been some other email address defined, this should never be called. Then the test should fail. And then we can also specify this expectation here. So PHP unit runs through all of this, and in the end, it verifies that the correct methods have been called and either gives you a correct result or not. So this, these are the basics of, of mocking. It will be a bit, um, might not be really intuitive at the beginning, but if you look at examples, it, it really makes sense. And then, yeah, this is the output when you run these implicit assertions. So in this case, um, PHP unit and prophecies are telling me, oh, I expected a mail call with the <coughs> exact admin at example.com address, but what you gave me was the other at example.com address. That doesn't really match. I expected something different. I'm failing the test, and that's why you then get one error and the red result. So that's all there is to it. It also gives me a nice backtrace. Uh -huh, this was in a test case on line 94. I know where to start. Test fixtures um, is when you test the input and the output of a method or a class, whatever it reads and produces. And we want to do that with well-known data sets because they have the advantage that every time you run those tests, they run on the same data. It's very predictable what the output should be and very reliable. Um, PHP unit has the concept of data providers for this and it uses the add data provider annotation. So we also saw a couple of annotations. Um, this is very common in PHP unit tests that you see this. Um, and what a data provider looks like is you have the actual test function, which is the first function here. It says test to string, so we want to test that some class correctly converts stuff to uh, a plain string. And what's different about this test method here, it suddenly has three parameters, because usually our test methods don't have any parameters. PHP unit just starts them and goes through them. And we specified here in the doc block that this test method has a data provider attached to it. And this is the function name, the exact function name being used here. It's, it says this is the provider to the two string method. And as you might guess already, this is an array of, of, of test cases. So we have one to three test cases here. And what we specify in the arrays is then passed up to the text parameters to the first parameter and the expected result that should come out of it. And even an assertion measures that we will use above there. And so we build up this array, return it, and then PHP unit will take each element of this array and run this test method above here three times. And in there we have uh, the assertion messages again, make sure that if we convert this object to string, uh, the expected stuff is coming out. Same for the JSON serialize here, oops. And then the test is green or not. So that's basically how data providers work. We used that a couple of times in Drupal core, so you can just grab for the add data provider um, annotation and we will f you will find some examples. Testing exceptions, what can we do about that? So the very naive solution is the ugly thing I wrote up here. Um, you have a my example function that might throw an exception. So how do I check that it really throws that exception when I pass it the test parameter? Um, I can call the function and if there is no exception, I can just fail the test, right? That would work. And I can catch the, the exception. Oh great, the exception has been thrown so we can pass the test. So I have, I have some fake assertion here, which is not really nice. I have to assert that true is really true, which is of course always true. So just to get in this branch, this is not really the ideal solution. PHP unit helps you out with that. You can say, set an expected exception for this test and whatever class the, the exception should be. So this basically corresponds to this class. And when I then invoke the function, it will throw the exception and PHP unit will catch that and know, ah, this is not a real exception. This is actually expected in this test case. So we are green. This is exactly the thing that should be working. There's also the add expected uh, exception annotation in PHP unit, but it's deprecated and the authors of PHP unit advise you to not use it because you cannot specify exactly where in your test case um, an, an exception is expected. So the set expected exception call should always be the um, 
the almost last element in your test before the actual function code. So when this is the last, uh, meth uh, last line in your test method, this should be the line before the last line. Because with the annotation, you don't know where this exception is thrown in the testing. And by using this method, uh, it's much more precise. That's why you should use that. Okay. Daniel, talking a bit about the tests. Yeah, so we have seen already some good examples of tests and assertions and stuff. And I will just continue with a couple of more best practices we actually observed or found out while uh, writing unit tests into the core. So the first one is about assertions. Um, you could write, as Klausi said, everything with assert equals. There's some expected value, some actual value. But uh, it is really hard to read. In this example, it's still okay. As it equals true, giraffe is bigger than 100, whatever unit. Um, but in, if you really like maintain a really big test suit, you want to have as few lines as possible and as precise lines as possible. Um, in this line, you would, for example, use as a true because that's exactly semantically saying and telling you this is what this line should expect. Another example where this um, comes up is the method assert instance of. This is checking whether the object on the right side is an instance of a specific class. Um, alternatively, you could, for example, use uh, assert true of true uh, or, or object instance of example class. But this kind of syntax with assert instance true is much easier to read. Like, I mean, of course, in a single test, you think, oh, so what? But it sums up over time. There are a lot of really custom assertions. For example, this one is a great example. As a JSON string equals JSON string. So, for example, you could use that in order to test your REST API. So you test that the REST API response returns, like, a certain bit of JSON. So, sure, you could use as equals and check two strings together. But what this one is doing is, for example, it decodes the value and compares the values, uh, decodes the string coming from your HTTP response. And by doing so, it can actually compare the values properly and then show you exactly like which key of the object exactly is different. <laughs> so by doing so, it just provides you a better um, time afterwards if something fails. Um, another best practice is to use less assertions per test. You could, of course, write a single test and do everything you would ever want in there, um, but this makes it really hard, for example, to figure out which kind of code is a problem when something fails. Instead, you rather write additional test functions for each logical thing you do. For example, um, uh, you have a method which tests the length of a string, and you would then have like a test length of string method. And then there's a special case, for example, the empty string. Um, you would have a test method test length of the string with empty string. And for the infinity case or something, you also want to write another test case for that. Um, another best practice, practice or not we have solved is the entire problem space of random data. So, one thing of testing, uh, one way of testing is you specify exactly the values you want. So, for example, I create a node with, in quote, my title, and the body is my text body, and so on and so forth, which is nice, it works, but it doesn't help you to find the edge cases. Um, for example, there's the edge case of some weird random characters which play a role in HTML, like the ampersand and the bigger sign and, I don't know, exclamation mark. Everything could cause an edge case. So one way to deal with that is to use random data instead of actual static strings. In this case, we provide the random string method in uh, Drupal, which generates a random string. But it not only generates a random string, it actually provides a random string with special characters always. So this is the, these are the two characters which are always included when we generate a random string. Um, on the other hand, that has downsides. For example, it makes it harder to debug. From you run it once, 
you get a failure, you run it again, and then the entire output looks different because you have different random strings. So think about whether you really want random data, but I would recommend for user input related stuff, it's probably better to have random data because that provides you potentially a better security. Um, yeah, and one thing we should experiment with is actually the idea to somehow be able to reset the random seed because then you could, for example, figure out, okay, this was the random seed we used to generate the random data, and then we could set the same random seed again on the next test run, and then it would produce the same random data, uh, but that's not in at all. Um, so another best, best practice is the idea of risky tests. PHP unit has a way to detect common problems with tests. Um, what are common problems with tests? Um, one, one is the idea of having no assertions. When you have no assertions, your test is pointless because it's testing nothing. Another common thing is unintentional code coverage. Um, uh, that happens if you like test a specific thing with a unit test, but you actually call out to some other code. But a unit test, by definition, should just test that unit and not something else. So by having the, those risky test detections, PHP unit can tell you, oh, you're actually calling out to some other code you probably don't want to call to. Another common thing is like output. Here you see print here. So you don't want to do that. It is bad PHP code to print out stuff because you want to collect the, the stuff together and then print out at the end of the, of the request. Um, another common thing is um, really slow code. So in this example, I just came up with like an example, sleep 20, you know, sleep function is probably working exactly the same as in JavaScript as a timer function, uh, but actually, you know, stuff like that can happen, right? And you want to detect that as early as possible. In this case, um, JavaScript timeout takes milliseconds, so um, maybe there was a bug here. Another common thing is to uh, change some global state. So for example, the global user class, uh, user variable, and that's also ba uh, bad practice. So risky tests allow us to detect common problems and you should totally enable them. We have enabled some of them by default, but not all of them. I think, for example, we have not enabled the slow test detection because browser tests, as we talked about, are much slower. So they would always fail, basically, because browser tests are slow. Um, another thing we found out is that we don't need T functions in our tests. So a T function translates our, uh, some arbitrary string. Um, you could do that in your test. So if, for, for example, you press a button and then you, you specify, okay, I want to press T save. So I want to press a save button and the T function is wrapped around that string. But actually it is pointless because the T function is doing basically nothing if you have no locale module enabled. And therefore, you, just, you don't test anything at all. Hmm. My screen is working. <laughs> Maybe, ooh, the matrix is coming. <laughs> what? Perfectly <laughs> readable. Shut it down. Oh, they did? Well, maybe they restarted it. Should I? Let's see. Yeah, I did. Hmm. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so anyway, best practice is don't use T functions in your test. Unlike, uh, unless you actually test translation related stuff. And you should do that, of course. Uh, another best practice is to write simple tests. So here at the top, we see an example of foam module. So in there, we have some set of code and then we get first the amount of unread topics, um, trans provide a string called uh, like one new test, uh, one new post, or, end, uh, or count new posts. Um, then we do an X path, which tries to find a certain link. And then we ensure that there are N amount of unread topics. 
given that your setup code is always deterministic, it always returns, in this example, six new unread topics. Okay, so this function always returns six. This function always returns six new posts. Um, and then you do, and then you, the assertion down here is always doing the same. So we could basically collapse it down to this single line. Uh, link exists six new posts. Um, so yeah, what I want to say with that, try to write readable and small tests, which kind of tests stuff. Another thing, what this example uh, shows you is that if you write those kind of lines, um, those are those enable you to refactor the underlying uh, application much easier. Of course, that one really implements and uh, or really needs some implementation details. For example, it requires that your HTML has like a table, and you know, at some point, people thought maybe tables are not a good way anymore. Maybe that will happen in the future. Um, so um, you know. Some kind of that kind of test code is much better to to maintain and read and everything. So another thing, which is a little bit of an abstract topic, is the idea of test abstractions. Um, you have abstract code, like code which does something for every entity type, uh, and then you want to test that. One thing you could do is you could iterate over every entity type, and then try to come up with the expected values for every entity type and then test that. So the problem is that you basically introduce the same kind of abstraction as you do in your one-time code if you do abstractions on your test code. And that has the problem that if your one-time code has a bug in their abstraction layer, your test probably has the same bug in your abstraction layer. So the alternative is to always use concrete examples. So instead of testing every entity type, just test node, user, and the entity test, the entity type, for example. So on the other hand, it is good to write test abstractions, but don't use the same abstractions in your test as in your one-time code, because tests are not your one-time code. Tests are totally different, and code style, or like best practices for one-time code, doesn't necessarily apply to test code. Anyway. Um, we've seen PHP unit now for a while, and uh, we want to bring it into core and really leverage it for everything. And this is the battle plan we came up with during discussions in the recent months. Um, so what we agreed on is we create a sandbox where we convert as much as possible. Um, we get that working and proper working, like uh, resilient against random test failures. So for example, the plan is to convert everything and then run it against the test bot really often so we can detect random test failures. Like if every tenth one causes a failure because of some bug somewhere, um, we want to detect that as early as possible because we don't want to block like other work which is going on like, I don't know, media or stuff like that. So. By, do, um, by having like a sandbox in which we experiment, um, we can uh, ensure that. And then like when we are done, hopefully until February 2017, which is the 8.3 alpha, the plan is then to commit this big, big bang patch into core and then hopefully most of the conversions um, are done. Um, at the end, I want to invite you to discuss a little bit about it. There are a lot of questions you could ask because uh, the testing framework is not just um, that. It, for example, simple test provided a UI. What should we do with it? Like, are you using the UI? Is it useful? What do we do with it? Like, do we replace it with another UI? Do we remove it? Do we just keep it? Um, do we improve it for PHP unit? Yeah, open questions. Another one is what do we do with the run test.sh command? This allows you to run tests using simple tests, uh, for simple tests. But you know, we have PHP unit, and if, as we saw before, you can just run them with PHP unit. So do we need it? Um, a couple of more questions is, uh, for, are, for example, do we use, so we are using Phantom.js and some Gaston.js, which is weird custom stuff in a way. Um, should we instead use Selenium and WebDriver, which are actual browsers? 
Um, so we can plug in like Firefox or something like that, which is much better, potentially. Uh, another question is, when do we deprecate and remove simple tests finally? Or should we ever do that or something? So yeah, please ask questions and um, yeah, let's discuss. Yeah, so there's a microphone over there. You can, if you speak in a microphone, then it's in a recording and everybody can hear it. So in the meantime, what we discussed yesterday for deprecating and removing simple test, if you can make this happen to have this in 2017, in February, committing a big bang patch where we do a lot of conversions, then we might um, make simple test deprecated one release after that. So for Drupal 8.4, so we'd have a gradual process as soon as the um, conversion is done, we um, commit the deprecated tag to the 8.4.x.branch branch. so with the next release, when that comes out in, a, in about a year, really simple test is deprecated and we should start every new test that we write should really be a browser test base which uses PHP on it. Um, yeah, for the simple test UI, I think I opened an issue a couple of months ago and it, it got some, some feedback that people are actually using it, the simple test UI. So what we discussed yesterday is that we will try to pump as much output that PHP unit gives us into this legacy simple test UI so that even if you execute a PHP unit test uh, from this simple test UI, which is currently possible to some extent, so that you at least see some um, debug output, for example, which URLs the browser has um, actually visited and also which assertion has failed and at, at which line. This should be possible with not too much effort. The reason we want to get, get rid of simple test UI because we don't want to have the maintenance burden, right? Um, we are switching to PHP unit because we don't want to be in the business of maintaining our own test runner because basically simple test has been committed to core and there is no external maintenance. We have to, all, to do this all ourselves and we actually want to leverage PHP unit which is supported by a wider audience by several frameworks and other projects. Yep. Nobody's asking questions here. I'm just answering my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can continue to discuss. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, go. Be quick. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the, the first time they, I approached the new testing way, <clears throat> I, got some, I got stuck because um, one example that we'll probably have is the data provider. We, am I right saying that we can use data provider uh, on, on unit testing and using the... Um, PHP unit test case and not with the web tests. Yeah, usually the use case for data providers mostly in unit tests and the kernel tests, integration tests, they might make sense there as well. For browser tests, they should still work. So the problem with browser tests is that they are really slow and each data provider entry starts up a new Drupal instance. So it's really a trade-off. If you use a data provider with browser tests and you have just few test cases in your data provider, then Drupal will install um, the site four times, the, the, the test site four times, and run it for each set, uh, for each entry in this in this set, and it makes it really, really slow. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's it's good to have to be at the presentation because I, I now I do understand the same problem that I had is with the cover. Um, and I was trying to test a a, um, a Drupal internal function and. Uh, uh, probably on, 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 on defining the cover tag, probably the module is not loaded at that time, yeah. and I get an exception. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, it would be good to, it's good now to understand, it would be good to have these in a documentation somewhere, which yeah. tags yeah. you can use with this tag, with this test. Yeah. Uh, which you can we started to write PHP unit documentation at drupal.org slash php unit. So there's a, now a browser test tutorial which you can look at. There's some explanations how to run php unit tests. There's a bit about kernel test case and, and how to use that. Um, what did I want to say? But yeah, the PHP unit documentation itself on phpunit.de, for whatever reason, is pretty good. Like, if you want to learn about unit testing itself, go to that site. It has a lot of documentation and, like, it explains every assertion and uh, providers and whatnot. Yeah, and for, totally his both. for historic yeah. reasons, uh, some Drupal stuff is really hard to test because we, have, we had a different code base in Drupal 7, and it's also the reason why. It, find almost zero unit test coverage in Drupal 7 because it was so hard to unit test Drupal 7 because it was very hard to swap out dependencies our code uh, depended on. So functions were just calling other functions. How do you swap out a function call which is just hard coded, it doesn't work. 
So that's the reason why we have so many web tests and had to basically write uh, everything in PHP unit tests from, from scratch for Drupal 8. And even Drupal 8 is not that um, mature yet that we have to do sometimes some weird module includes so that constants are there. This is really a problem, yes. Unfortunately, Drupal 8 is not the perfect system that it should be. <laughs> Beside the five or four years. <laughs> <laughs> it's still pretty good. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick note. It's sometimes uh, nice to uh, test the zero case, an empty mm -hmm. array, yeah. the empty string, or something with just one item. So it's number zero, number one, because <laughs> often you have some special behavior for that, and, and then it works for all the other numbers, and just for zero, it suddenly does something. Or it, instead of re returning false, it returns null or something. Mm -hmm. And so you sometimes want to have a special test for that one. Yeah. yeah. I would advise not to use assert empty or something, so you should always make sure that the data types that you are asserting yeah, okay. with are exactly the same. Equal sign, like, is that yes. is yeah. identical with something? Yeah, like use assert null or assert false. Yes, then you get the exact yeah. match. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I was mostly talking about uh, empty string as a parameter of some function that you want to test, not as a return value. But of course, it's also yeah. Yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You touched on it a little bit with the random data uh, testing. Mm -hmm. How does PHP unit integrate with fuzzing database or fuzz testing? Um, I think not out of the box, yeah, as I, far as I know. I haven't seen anything, but I'm, I would bet there is some kind of um, PHP unit plugin out there which uh, does that kind of stuff. So what we have in Drupal yeah. Core is a trait which provides the random data. I'm not a big fan of it, so my stance on this issue is that you shouldn't use random data at all in your test because it makes the test unpredictable. I'm a fan of predictable tests, so always the same string. Daniel made a point that it's important to test special characters, and the problem is if you test special characters only sometimes, you will only get sometimes fails, so you have random test fails. This makes dealing with, with random data really really annoying to me. I don't like it when tests randomly fail and I have to track it down. What, what was the cause? Well, because which character in the random string was it? Which what? Yeah. Right. Well, but on the other hand, you don't find the uh, random test failures <laughs> if you don't have random <laughs> test failures. Yes, and that's <laughs> true. Then you have no coverage at all. That's right, because yeah, right. Th those are actual bugs in your code, not yeah. bugs in your tests. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you find something, if you know something, yeah. <laughs> um, just maybe open a, up an issue. I mean, for XSS, for yeah. example, it could be pretty useful, actually, mm -hmm. for XSS tests and mm -hmm. that kind of security-related stuff. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Um, you've talked about um, mocking uh, subsystems and things like that. I wonder if there is a way to mock um, external web services, for example, if you want to talk to a different application and you want to mock that in so you don't have that component interfering with your, with your test or with your, uh, with mm. your code. So, yeah, this, there are a couple of possibilities. They go from very primitive to very high level. Mm -hmm. So in Drupal 7, for example, I remember you could use Drupal HTTP request and it actually had a variable in there um, which function it should use to call. So you could swap that out and provide a static function which returns a static JSON instead of going out some, to some web request and doing something. So you can do stuff like that. Or you, if you use proper dependency the injection and you have some HTTP client injected into your, your class that you want to test that then makes the request, you can say, I will give it a fake, PHP, uh, fake HTTP client and then it calls a method on that fake. And of course the fake is totally under your control and you can totally mock it. So if you do um, object-oriented programming properly with dependency injection, it's not such a big of a deal. One addition to the last question, you can also use um, tools like SOAPUI for mocking your actual uh, web services. You can uh, completely program every response, every uh, every operation, every chain you want. So you have actually two sets. On the one hand, you have your code under test, and on the other hand, you have a programmed set of responses in the SOAPUI environment. Ah. That's the way we use to test uh, and develop against uh, mock services. Uh, what was the name again? Uh, SOAP UI. SOAP UI. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, you can use it for SOAP interfaces and REST interfaces uh, nowadays. That's good so, to know. Yeah. I think there was also some PHP project which used the metaphor of a video recorder. Mm. 
So I think you can say record and you have some API course and it would record and write those responses down and then you can replay those responses in your test. Yeah, that, that's possible and with SOAP UI, if you have uh, WSDL, you can have SOAP UI uh, create uh, a mock service, uh, automatically create mock responses, things like that. Ah. It's actually really handy for testing uh, web services. So. Yeah, it's good to know. Thank you. So I think with that, I think we are finished. Thanks for your attention. And <laughs> one general announcement, join us on Friday for the contribution sprints. Even if you haven't contributed to Drupal Core or any contrib module, um, there's a good first time sprinter workshop where you can get started with Drupal development, also mentored core sprints to work on Drupal Core. It's a great opportunity to, to join the community. And don't forget to evaluate the sessions on uh, the event site so that we can nice reviews and get to do this again. Thank you.